Good morning and welcome to another video. Normally I cut into a rainy, horrible scene in London at this point, but not today because I'm somewhere a little bit warmer. In today's interview, I'll be talking to a photographer that I've been following for years. Actually, he was one of the first photographers that I've followed since opening my Instagram account back in 2018. And that is Jordan Hammond. He's a travel photographer based out of Bali and he's known for his like insane landscapes, cityscapes and general travel photography. This is a very interesting episode for me because I've been looking up to his work for so long and also because it's so different to what I shoot and probably different to what most of you would shoot as well. So getting to know his process, his thoughts, and just how he approaches photography is gonna be very interesting. So do stick around for this one. All right, and hello, Jordan. Tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, and what you do. Sure, my name's Jordan, as you just heard from Roman. Uh, yeah, I'm a photographer, travel photographer. I usually go with photographer and I have been for the past, how long? Six or seven years, I guess, full time. And yeah, I spend most of my time in Southeast Asia on a scooter riding around, getting lost and taking pictures of things that I think are interesting. And next question is, how would you describe your photography? <laughs> yeah, how would I describe my photography? I was saying, like, somebody asked me this question a couple of months ago. I met them for the first time and they asked me, how do I describe my photography? And I struggled to answer it, so I had to give it some thought over recent months. And to be honest, if I can put it simply, like, my photography is just a... In part, it's like a precisionist take on, I guess, travel and cultural themes. It's kind of difficult because there's so many things that I do shoot, right? It's like, I'll do aerials of interest in buildings. I'll do... I guess like travel landscape ish photos that have got what well, that will most normally involve like a person walking down the street or coming towards the frame or walking out of a shop and I mean it's just a whole shit show there's a whole mix of things so I don't really know how to describe it oftentimes I guess it's I, I usually describe my process as a, as a instead of like describing like my style of photography the process is just getting lost and, and photographing things that kind of you know take my eye I guess yeah All right, so the next question is, when did you start photography and why did you pick up a camera in the first place? I started photography in 2015. I was moving out to China in, I think, August 2015 to teach English for a year in Chongqing. And I got a camera because I wanted to, I think, just document my travels and the city I was living in and to share it with my family and friends back home. And actually, I found when I moved out there, I mean, I was completely overwhelmed with this I, I don't know, Chinese culture, being in a city of 36, 37 million people, like I think I'm officially the biggest city on earth. It was just a complete and utter like, head fucks, to be honest. <laughs> to be honest. And so having that camera actually gave me a reason to kind of get out of the house and to explore the city I was living in. And I think really it became like a mental break for me from, from everything else that I was trying to process at the time. And then that slowly morphed into an obsession I say slowly, pretty quickly, I think, morphed into an obsession with taking photos. And yeah, after long, I think after a couple of months of doing that, I decided, yeah, I mean, once this year is up and I've got a bit of money, like, I'm done. Like, I'm quitting this. Like, let's see how we can kind of take this full time. Yeah. And the next question is what camera do you use and what's your go to focal length or lens? Okay. Canon R5, 2470. It's basically all I use. I don't know if I have a go-to focal length, um, yeah, as is the nature of having a zoom lens, but I'd say I go between 24, 35, and maybe up to around 40, 45-ish. I mean, I rarely use anything from 50 up to 70. Um, but, but they're my go-tos. I find that that's what works for my, for my style. I've also got a 15, 35. I never really go below 20 because they start getting distorted and I don't know, it just feels like a 2015 thing. And then I've got a 7200, which I literally never used. Like, it's just gathering cobwebs. I think I brought it today to like weigh down my bag a bit so I didn't feel like I was just carrying a bag of air with me. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. then many uh, photographers use primes, 
you mostly use Zooms. Is there any particular reason why you'd pick a Zoom over a, a Prime? Is it a personal choice? or? Uh, it's completely personal. I think I'm just kind of lazy at heart and it's become a habit of mine. Like I've always used Zooms. I've had one Prime. I had a, was that Nifty 50, like the, the 51.8 Canon, which, which was cool, but I always found myself like having to switch out to another lens and so I think I just got comfortable using this like mid-range zoom lens like it covers all bases for me I mean this RF 2470 2.8 is like super fast to focus and it's not I, I can understand how this might be overwhelming sometimes like you know with a prime let's say you, you could be stood in one you've only got one focal length to work with right so it's more about moving your body around and working with that one focal length whereas with a zoom you can move around and change your focal length as well so it's this like infinite possibilities and I can imagine how maybe for beginners that'd be a little bit overwhelming but I don't know works for me although I have considered getting some primes like I, I think I mentioned it in a video the other day like I thought about I don't need a Leica just to get primes so that, that's a that's ridiculous to be to be honest <laughs> but I thought about getting a Leica in like I don't know, maybe spending, I don't know, six months with like a 28 mil or something like that. Like that's something I've done in like recent years. I went over a period in COVID, I pretty much used my drone for like a year straight. Oftentimes I'd go out to shoot with only my drone. Like I wouldn't even take a camera with me. Just so I could practice with that one focal length from certain perspectives to try and like improve my skills with that. I think I've probably gone way off tangent to be honest on, on like no, no. cameras that I use and lenses that I use. But yeah, my go-to is 2470. It's on my camera 99% of the time. Cool. Works for me. All right, and the next question is, this is a very common question that I would personally get, and that is, what is travel photography? What is a travel photographer? You are a travel photographer, but what is that? Okay. Well, I'll do my best to, to explain what it is because I think there's many ways in which you can probably answer this, but I think if I had to, like, break it down or, or give a concise answer I'd say that like a travel photographer is someone that captures the nuances of a place kind of in its entirety so it could be and I, actually it could be I think it would be an it would involve a mixture of like landscape street portraits cultural events things like that I think a travel photographer is usually capturing the essence of a place like in its entirety so this is another distinction between what Jordan does and what I do so whereas Jordan's a travel photographer he works with travel brands and his entire thing is to capture the essence of being somewhere whereas me on the other hand I would class myself as a traveling photographer because I don't work with tourism boards I don't travel to just capture you know the essence of being somewhere I travel because I enjoy travel and just taking photos so a lot of my images even though they were taken in a particular place they could in theory be taken anywhere else in the world Whereas for Jordan, it's more about capturing that specific mood of that specific place that could then be used to be sold to a tourism board, to promote the place, etc. Now you look like a trendy YouTuber holding your mic. I am a trendy YouTuber <laughs> holding my mic. Hey. All right, so the next question is, what's your thoughts on setting up shots? So many times within travel photography, you'll see a photo and if I'm honest I've seen some of your photos where I thought that looks almost too perfect to be true thank you uh, <laughs> what's your thoughts on setting up shots in general okay like the TLDR I think it's fine so long as you're open about it and I don't think you have to be open about it right I don't think you have to declare that something was set up I think if somebody asks you oh, was this a legit moment or did you set it up? Just be okay with telling them that you set it up. In, in my opinion, it's still art. You know, you're still, I, I see that staging things like that almost as like stage directing or something like that. And it can still evoke emotions in the viewer. And so I still consider it to be art. A shot I took maybe six or seven years ago, I can't remember, in Myanmar, I walked into this pagoda. As a monk sat in the, in the window frame, light rays like beaming out from behind him, candles either side, like, like something like, you know, just I freaked out, like totally geeked over this like scenario. And there's another guy shooting there, like, maybe a Chinese photographer. And I just thought he'd stumbled upon that too. I was none the wiser. I'd only been shooting for a year or so. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this is, this must be legit. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. But the more time I spent like in, I guess you could call that like photo tourism space. I don't really know what else to call it. 
yeah, the more the more you realise that oh, a lot of this stuff is actually set up. I mean, especially in Asia, it's massive, and in Bali, it's massive too. So I can see why sometimes people might think that oh, you set up your shots, man. I know you do, like because everyone else does it there. But it's all right. I can say I used to. I'd say maybe from 2017, 18, probably for a year, year and a half maybe to mid 2019, and then I just I don't know naturally progress not necessarily beyond that as if the not staging is a better thing to do but yeah just progress in a different direction and i don't know it just felt like it was not cheating but maybe doing a disservice to the incredible culture of the place that i was visiting yeah so anything i think from like mid 2019 onwards is, is all legit and if you have any questions about it please dm me i'll be happy to like clarify the stories yeah Jordan's already making friends with the locals and I think he's going to take his portrait, the guy who is in uh, that cab. The funniest thing is he's literally paused the entire operation to take that photo for Jordan and now they're waiting <laughs> to resume work while he finishes sharing that photo with him. <laughs> Love it. Ah, uh, one photograph? Yeah, go on. All right. Three, two, one. I'll send this into here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Have a good day. <laughs> bye bye. Try not to fall. And there we go. Thank you. Bye bye. And that, it's ladies and gentlemen, is a masterclass in how you take street portraits of other people. Free of charge. No, that was awesome, man. And I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't travel much in like Europe or America or, uh, or Africa or anything like that. But my experience in Asia, in general, doesn't matter if I'm in the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, or up north in Japan. Maybe not Japan, but uh, maybe China or something. So it's pretty similar. Like. Good people everywhere. Like, and if you approach them with a, you know, a smile and just say hello, like, more often than not, they're, they're totally cool with hanging out and, you know, okay with having a few pictures taken. Like, it's pretty chill. It's good people everywhere. That was really fascinating to watch because personally, I don't come up to people and chat to them and get their portraits. It's just not something that I do. However, being able to watch Jordan do that has been really eye-opening and to the point where even I'm now considering of doing that in the future. Um, yeah, that was really cool to watch. From photographing volcanoes to coffee cups. I've really gone downhill. <laughs> <laughs> We've just stopped for some food. And while we're having some food, or before the food comes, it's on to the next question, which is, your photos have a pretty distinct look to them. Jesus. Your photos have a pretty distinct look to them, especially you know, where you have loads of strong greens and blues. You know what I'm talking about. Teals and oranges. That's it. Uh, uh, yeah. So the question is, <laughs> is it in the edit or is it in the photo that you take? Me specifically? Yeah. I'd like to think it's... I don't know if it's for me to judge, uh, but I'd like to think it's, it's more about the shot. I mean, at least for me, it's much more about the shot, the, the timing of it, the the structure of the image, like the, the structural, not integrity of the image, it's not a building, but yeah. the, the flow to the image, right, and the time that goes into finding these moments and and then hopefully capturing them. But I think the edit is maybe, I don't think it's an equally important part as the photo, you know, um, but maybe it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a large part of my of my shots. It's like a I really enjoy the editing process. Um, I don't necessarily know if my my edits are unique to me, but I think I mean from what I've heard anyway, people seem to recognise my photos. You know, based on a combination of those yeah. two things, right? Like, oh, this is like typically how George would structure a photo, and they look like his colours as well. I don't know. I, I don't think it's about the mainly about the colour grade though. I think if your photos are mainly about the colour grade, then they're probably crap. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It's not about the it's not about the color grade, and I don't think I don't think it should be. You shouldn't be relying on that to to try and make your photo a more impressive photo because it's not doing it. Yeah. 
at least to anyone I think that has a, a moderately artistic eye, I didn't think the grade will make too much of a difference. Yeah. We're just getting pissed on the rose water. Absolutely gattered. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is, was there a particular point in your photography where you thought, okay, now I'm really making progress. I'm starting to understand this more. I understand what I'm doing and this is all kind of coming together. Was that a particular point or? Mm, I think there's been a number of points. Um, th there's, one in, there's one particular time that comes to mind. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna explain the shot. Maybe it comes up on screen, I don't know. But th there was a shot in East Bali. It's a place I spent a lot of time, especially during COVID. Um, you know, I was not stuck in Bali, it was by choice, glad to be there. But I, I spent almost every single day for a 16 month period. I was up at 5 a.m. going out for sunrise. And most of that was spent in East Bali. Um, and I remember one of the shots I got, which was down this down this street, it kind of runs downhill, it's got the jungle on the other side of it, leading to the volcano, bamboo poles over the street, lenticular cloud on the mountain. I mean, for me, that was like a, a perfect scene, but I think above all, it, it just taught me the value of, uh, maybe one of the most important lessons I've learned in photography, which is more to do with like perseverance and, um, well, yeah, just perseverance, right? Yeah. Like, being willing to go back time and time and time again until you're able to bring a particular vision you have to life. And so I'd say that that, that would probably be the one time, yeah, where I felt like, okay, maybe I'm, I'm kind of getting it now, uh, what this is all really about. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know, I think there's also probably been a number of other times where I felt that way. And I think that may be true for other photographers too. You reach these stages where it's like, oh yeah, I'm finally getting it. Five, maybe six months later, Oh yeah, I'm finally getting it, <laughs> right? You look back six months and you're like, what the hell was I thinking like back then, you know? Um, so it's almost like this constant constant cycle of, of figuring things out, trying to improve on what you've already done. It's a vicious, endless cycle. So next question is, if you can give one piece of advice to a beginner who's asking for just one tip, one trick, whatever you want to call it, to get better at photography, what would it be? First, download my presets. Two, don't download my presets. <laughs> Number two, uh, would honestly just be to shoot as much as possible. Um, I think that genuinely is the only way you're gonna get better. You know, you can watch as many videos as you want, sign up to as many courses as you like, download as many preset packs, preset packs as you want. I think the only real way to like improve your photography um, no matter what stage you're at, it doesn't matter if like you're right at the beginning. I think this advice sticks to people who've been doing it for a long time as well. The only way to, to continue improving is to, is to get out there and shoot as much as possible. And I think especially when you're beginning, you don't have to tie yourself to one specific thing. If you're interested in one specific thing, then great, like, go for that. But if you find that you're interested in, I don't know, a multitude of different things, as, as I've taught many people and found out that many people who are starting are interested in, but just go for it. Just fucking enjoy the process and get out and shoot as much as possible. Like, yeah, yeah. that's it. Very yeah. good. And the last question before we wrap up is, where do you see photography going over the next 10 years? Ooh. I think in some ways, I think it will remain like very much the same, uh, but I suppose there are many, many things that will change uh, like at the same time. So, I think, of course, like cameras are gonna like continue to improve, you know, higher resolution, better low light capabilities. I don't know, all, all this stuff that I think at this point doesn't really matter, you know, is how much better do you need it, to, to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, I think AI will have a huge effect on, on maybe the technology that we use. I don't think it will replace, it might replace stock photography. I don't know if anyone does that anymore, to be honest, but I think that will massively replace like those who are creating stock photography. Um, but I think it will be really interesting to see how AI kind of affects like the gear we're using. Like I, I wonder sometimes like, imagine you're out in the field and you've got this kind of, I don't know how to explain it, like some AI device like in your camera. Imagine you're like taking photos and it's, as soon as you take it, it's already edited your photo in your exact style. That would be quite cool. Do you know what I'm saying? So you don't have to, I mean, I enjoy the editing process, but I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that don't. Wedding photographers. Just, right, they'd rather, yeah, exactly. They'd rather just get the photos and be done with it. And so you might be, have, be able to have this AI device like in your camera that will edit the photos straight away. It could be, imagine like compositional tips or something. Imagine you're like looking through your viewfinder or through the screen and you've got this AI thing that's like advising you to like 
maybe move to a certain position or like reposition the subjects and stuff like that. Like I, I'm sure they will have them, right? Like I think for for people like us, they might take away from the the charm yeah, yeah. of it. There's just a lot of people out there that probably don't care that much, and we'd just rather get better at photos without or having to think yeah. too much or maybe go through that process themselves. Um, yeah. Now I think about it, maybe it will change a lot in, in, <laughs> in the next 10 years in, in some respects, but um, I guess we'll find out. I mean, right. we're still going to be here. Yeah, you hopefully. Know, roaming around, taking photos in the streets and stuff like that. I don't think that will very much change, but yeah, we'll see, man. I'm pretty excited about it, to be quite honest. Yeah, excited to see where it goes. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed that video with Jordan. I definitely picked up a few bits from him and I hope you have too. Of course, this is a different day now. However, I am sitting next to the next guest that will be on the channel. We'll be filming today and his photography is so different to anything I've had on the channel before that I think you will really enjoy this episode today. Jordan started his YouTube channel recently, he's uploaded a few videos, so do go and check that out, subscribe and support. Also, his Instagram is linked down below. But apart from that, that's it. So thank you so much for watching, thank you for the continued support on the videos, and I'll see you soon. Bye. If you're finding this video useful and wish to support the channel, then one of the best ways to do so is to check out my photography zines. I publish a zine following each major trip or destination where I share not only the photos that you might have seen, but also a ton of photos that I didn't share on social media. The zine is the lowest cost way one can support the channel and also see many photos that have never been shared. For more information, see the links in the description and thank you for your support.